Good morning, good morning. Who's excited for church? Come on. Two of you, awesome. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, 50 days after Easter, Christians call this holiday Pentecost Sunday. And it has significance because 40 days after Jesus died, he departed into heaven. And then he said, guys, don't leave until the promise of the Father. And in John chapter 20, after he had resurrected, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Listen, they already had the Holy Spirit, but he wanted them to wait for something extra. And then in John chapter, Acts chapter 2, the um, day of Pentecost, and some of you are like, what's Pentecost? It's literally the word 50. And some of you are afraid of Pentecost. So we're going to pass out the offering buckets. You can get rid of your 50s this morning, and we'll, <laughs> we don't want you to live with a spirit of fear. But there's something special that God wants to give us. In, in the Old Testament, only the, the prophets had the Spirit of God. But then there was a day where Jesus was saying, I, I, I long for the day where I pour out my Spirit on all flesh, on your sons and your daughters. And we, we just want to celebrate. Man, this church was not birthed on the talents of my wife and myself. It's not even birthed on this amazing worship team. Can we just give up how good they, they, they sang this morning? This church was birthed by the Spirit of God. And the same Holy Spirit that fell on Jesus, that anointed Jesus, is the same Spirit that fell on the church in Acts chapter 2 and anoints the church. And to prepare our hearts on Friday before Pentecost Sunday, we're just going, man, as much of God as we have, we want more. We want more. And so we're praying from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. And just listen, before you call us crazy, we're joining up with 10 or 20 other churches in the Bay Area. We're all crazy. Welcome to the club. And we want to invite you. And to prepare our hearts for that, that Friday night, every Wednesday, next slide, every Wednesday at 6 a.m., we're just praying, preparing our hearts that God would fill a willing vessel with his spirit. Uh, if you're new, my name is Ali. My wife and I, we started this church uh, six years ago. Welcome to Bold Church. Come on. And we are in probably the most exciting, most controversial collection of talks called Love, Sex, and Marriage. And last week, we, if you see those boxes over there, we talked about the foundation of how we build our marriage. Uh, it, it, it often we built it on the physical, and God reversed it. He said, no, you got to build it on the spiritual. And today is, I just got to warn you, we tried to email you, we tried to put it on social media. Today is one of those subjects that like, I don't know, when I announce it, I'm not sure if you're going to clap or like rip your shirt off in excitement. <laughs> but today we're talking about sex. Yeah, two of you are like, yeah. Some of you are like, okay, I don't know if I should cheer or, and it's that weird awkwardness. Remember when we were in sixth grade and the teacher said, we're talking about sex education. And it was, if it was awkward in school, tell me, it's going to be awkward in the house of God this morning, let me tell you. And uh, some of you are like, why would you invite me today? <laughs> and some of you, you probably saw a social media ad, and today's your first Sunday, and you're like, oh my goodness, what kind of church is this? <laughs> let me just warn you, we're going to talk about this every Sunday. It's every other Sunday that we talk about this subject. But uh, we want to talk about what you talk about in the, on your home. If the world is talking about it, Come on, Vanderpump Rules, Love is Blind, Bachelor. These are the shows you love. These are the things that they do. So if we're talking about it on TV, why can't we talk about it in the house of God? Because the Bible that I read, he invented sex. A, a nickname he's never been given is the sex god. Why not? He invented it. But what I really want to do is I want to show you the, what happens when when this gift is in God's hands, it looks very different when the gift is in the devil's hands. So let me, let me put the slide on the screen. It's on how the devil attacks. You gotta realize that when God wants to build you up, he will bring a person. They'll speak life over you. They'll encourage you. They'll, they'll link arms with you and push you and build you up to the things of God. When the devil wants to tear you down, he'll bring a person. They'll gossip about you. They'll betray you. They'll let you down. It's the same person but it depends on whose hands it's in. When, when God wants to have spiritual breakthrough in your life, he'll say, deny your flesh. And when the devil wants you to be in bondage, he'll say, feed your flesh. The question is, 
your flesh, whose hands is it in? And God created sex with a context, with a container, male and female. And that's controversial to even say that. For some of you, that's, this is your last Sunday. Can't wait to see you never again. But you have to realize that God created this thing called sex. It's the thing that unites couples. It's not your budget. It's not your, that you're under the same house or you're sleeping in the same bed. Sex unifies you in a way that nothing else does. Your hobbies don't do it. The TV shows you love don't do it. Sex brings you together, which is why my advice to all the married couples, you should have all the sex you can, all the time. All the men... This is a house of God. <laughs> Honey, listen to this prophet. And my advice is simmer down because I'm coming for you in a moment. Just relax. Let me read you God's word. First, this is Genesis chapter 2. When you see it, someone say amen. amen. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and the, all the wild animals. For, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused for the Lord, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. So important, just let me just pause right there. God didn't take the bone from Adam's feet. You're not above her. He didn't take it from our head because she's not above us. He took it from our side because she's our peer. You gotta remember that. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. I love that. Adam is made from the dust outside of the Garden of Eden. Eve is made inside the garden. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He breaks out in a song. This is a Hebrew poetic song. She shall be called woman. Some translations say, whoa, man. <laughs> For she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united. Someone say United. Now, what you're probably thinking that that word means is marriage, and it's not. Because the same word is used in 1 Corinthians by the Apostle Paul. And he wrote these words in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, do you not know that he who unites, someone say unites. Yes. It's the same word. With a prostitute is one with her in body. For it is said that the two become one flesh. But whoever is united, someone say united, united. with the Lord is one with him in spirit. See, there is a, a sealing thing that happens, a, a, a bond, a stickiness that only sex can do. Do you know in the state of California that if you get married, your marriage isn't real until you have sex? That if, let's say you're, you're married for a week and you get divorced, they don't call it a divorce, they call it an annulment. Because the marriage, even the world realizes there is something sealing about sex that nothing else you do does. Which is why I wrote it like this. God uses sex to bring two people together. The devil uses sex to tear two people apart. It's the same gift. The question is, who's holding it? And for the last six years, I've been preaching about what sex looks like from a biblical perspective. What it looks like when it's in God's hands. I'm going to do something different today. Something I've never done. I'm going to talk about sex when it's in the devil's hands. So if you thought, listen, if you thought talking about sex in church was awkward, wait till you hear the today's subject. The porn myth. The porn myth. I've, I've touched on this briefly a few times. We're spending two hours this morning talking about the subject. <laughs> Sean, there's not a lot of jokes. I gotta get them as much as I can. But I, I've been a pastor now for almost 15 years. Been a Christian. This June will be 20. I've seen nothing more than porn. Listen, tear marriages apart, ruin relationships faster. And not just with people. I've never seen someone on fire for God and their fire go out because of this. And there is this myth that we believe. And I want to shatter that in the name of Jesus. So you can bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to, we need prayer this morning.
Lord, we just talking about a touchy, crazy subject that often is not talked about in church. But God, we're not afraid to talk about the things the world is talking about. God, we're, we, want to, we want to be shy. We want to be bold about this subject. We want to be biblical. God, we're, we're acknowledging that this thing is such a touchy subject. But I just believe, God, there are so many people in this room that struggle with it. I pray, Lord, that it wouldn't just be a sermon, a TED Talk, but a change in someone's life. That we walk in one way, God, but we would walk out another. And if you believe that, everybody said? Amen. Everybody said? Amen. Come on, we just give up a round of applause for Jesus this morning. Come on. I thought I'd break the ice by telling you my porn story. Isn't that everyone's favorite subject? Come to you, that's why you come to church? To learn when your pastor got addicted to porn. Everyone's favorite subject, yeah. But, but there are many of you, you just gotta understand our church. Our church, we started this church six years ago with a dream. We wanted to create a place where not only we can build believers, help Christians live like Christians, but also build a place where unchurched people can come explore faith. And so I, 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 there is no doubt this is the word of God. This is infallible. I, I don't wanna deny that, but there are, there are some of you that are exploring. So I, I wanna speak to you before I speak to, to, to the saints real quick. And, and you don't even need this to believe how damaging and how crazy porn is. And I just want to give you some of the resources that are used to prepare for this sermon. It's, it's on your screen. It's, it's two books and a website. The, the Porn Myth, which is where I took the title of this book uh, for the sermon, and Your Brain on Porn. There is so much, listen, neurological, psychological, and sociological evidence on the, the power and the damage that porn does, not just to our bodies, but to our relationships and to our culture and society as a whole. And there's a website, fightthenewdrug.org, uh, that kind of discusses this. And let me kind of read you this quote. It says, studies have shown that for male and female porn consumers, their habit is often accompanied by problems with anxiety, body image issues, insecurity, and depression. Even reducing the amount of gray matter in the brain. So I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds awful. What's gray matter, Pastor Ali? <laughs> gray matter is, is, is the part of your brain that allows you to make logical decisions. And the more you lose those things, you become less human and more primal. That's just what it does to us. Do you know what it does to our society? Do you know that many of the times when we're, we watch porn, the people on the screen aren't actors, but they're slaves? By some estimates, 4.8 million people are trapped right now and forced into sexual exploitation globally. According to anti-trafficking non Profit Rescue Freedom, in nine countries, check this out, 49% of the sexually trafficked women who were rescued said that they were being recorded while they were being forced to having sex. That's mind-boggling that half the porn on the internet are not actors, they're slaves. And what's crazy for me is I watch all these Netflix specials about how we're destroying the, the ocean we'll by eat the fish we eat and how the cows that we eat, we kill. It's not even humane. I wrote like this. We'll stop eating meat because of the way we treat cows in slaughterhouses, but we won't stop the way we treat women with the same information. For whatever reason, we treat cows better than women in our culture. That's what porn does. And then there's a magazine called Science Magazine. You know it's legit when the word science is in the name. <laughs> science Magazine. There were an article called Till Death, Till Porn Does Us Part. And they said this. They found that adding pornography to a marriage, check this out, doubles, doubles the likelihood of divorce. And, and the thought is, Pastor Ali, why are we talking about this subject? I'm Gucci. It's been like a week since I struggled with this thing. I'm good right now. That's, that's why I said that joke that way. Because 70% of Christian men, 64%, almost 65% of Christian men admit to watching porn once a month. 15% of Christian women. And the reasons why they watch it are different. Men watch it for pleasure, research those, and women watch it to get education so they can see what their man is expecting, which is devastating. It's devastating. Uh, if you're under the age of 25, you're born after the year 2000, Gen Z, there is something very different about your generation. See, I'm a millennial. I was born in the 80s. We're the greatest generation ever. I'm a pastor. I got to preach the truth. 
But my generation was the first generation where more people were addicted to pornography than any other generation before them. When I sit down with a dude and he's my age or under, I go, how often do you watch porn? It's not if, it's how often. My pastor never asked that question because it wasn't accessible in his generation. Gen Z is different. 80% of Gen Z watches porn once a month. Gen Z is the only generation, check this out, where 70% of them have sent nudes in the last 12 months. They not only consume porn, Gen Z is a generation, they're producing porn now. And their body's doing it. And, and, and for everyone in this room, no matter what generation you are, post-porn, post-COVID, porn consumption went up 42%. And it has not dropped since. So when people say, why are you talking about this subject? Because no one else is. Because everyone else outside the church is, it's time we talk about it in the church. Now I'll tell you, again, when I got exposed, and uh, the first time I saw a naked body was a, a Playboy magazine, but that wasn't the first time I watched porn. Uh, this was 1991. I was 11 years old. I'm exposing how old I am. And uh, this is a time when there was no internet. We didn't have like, you didn't like stream anything. You had to pay a dude. This is going to be shocking to some of you. It sounds like dinosaur A's. You paid a dude, and he would put a box on top of your TV called a cable TV box. Anyone remember those days? Come on. Yes, most of you. Then if your dad was a little hood, he'd slip that guy a 20 or a 100, and he would turn some knobs, flickety-flack. I don't know how it works, but you get extra channels like ESPN and Disney and the channels you shouldn't be watching. So my friend calls me over and like, guys. My dad has this extra box, and the dude did the flickety flack come over. And that was the first time I didn't just look at pictures, I saw porn, and it was the end of innocence. And it was the beginning of what would then be a 15 year addiction that couldn't break. And I got saved at 24. It, it, that thing didn't break over me until the age of 26. Imagine how awkward it is coming to church. And I know because I've been there myself. And I'm not saying this to shame anyone. But you raise your hands in worship knowing that that week prior you raised your hands for different things. And it's hard to hide and pretend. It takes more energy to pretend that you're doing fine when you're dying on the inside. That's why we got to talk about this. And I'm praying the story that God did in my life, it's not going to end there. He wants to do it in your life. So I'm going to begin this sermon like a preacher and end it like a professor. I'm going to yell in the beginning, come after you. You're going to be very uncomfortable, but then you're going to have hope in the end. Is that okay? Yeah. Let's go. I, I got to give you four, four false expectations that porn gives you, four myths that you believe in your head, and then four things I had to do to get free. We're going to with the first false expectation. It gives you a false expectation of what a person's body should look like. When you spend hours looking at fake bodies and then spend minutes looking at real ones, what will happen is like, my girl don't got it no more. Because you're looking at a body that's not real. It's airbrushed. It's been under surgery. That's not how people look. And then you'll think there's something wrong with your spouse. Pastor Alec, tell my girl to work out as if your six pack is popping. And then you'll think, my girl don't got, she needs a Peloton for Christmas. I've seen those gifts and you'll have conversations, babe, have you ever considered getting breast implants? And you think the problem is her body. The problem is you watch so much porn, your expectation of the human body is changing. Your girl is beautiful problem is you've forgotten. That's what porn does. It changes what beautiful is. It changes that expectation. Second thing porn does, the false expectation, it changes what sex should look like. You know, they're acting. Bodies don't bend like that. When I was in uh, elementary school, middle school, there was this movie by Arnold Schwarzenegger came out and said, the last action hero. Anyone remember that movie? Okay, it was awesome. I loved it. It, was, it got terrible reviews. But what was crazy about this movie is that Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's a movie actor in a movie about a movie actor. And when he was the movie actor, he could shoot a gun and the car would explode. And then the movie actor 
comes into real life, and he, he's chasing criminals. And so he shoots the gun in real life, and the car doesn't explode, and he can't understand why. When you look at fake sex, and you spend hours looking at it, then when you come to the real thing, you're like, why doesn't sex look like this? You know, we're, we're currently experiencing right now, for the first time in American history, more men deal with erectile dysfunction, two words I never thought I'd say in church, <laughs> than any other generation. And it's not that our bodies ain't working, but we spend so much time looking at the fake thing, we expect that to be the real thing. Third, false expectation, and it only gets heavier and heavier. That sex is available at all times. See, when you're single, I'm just going to go there, you're feeling horny, you get alone, and you can deal with it. And then you get married, and you bring that expectation that when you want it, you get it. And then you go to your wife, let's go, let's go. You don't realize you can't turn your wife on the way you do a tablet. It's not a button you press. It's a woman you love. And that's usually when they come to me, Pastor Ali, tell her. You love sex, tell her to do it. As if there's something wrong with her. The problem is, she's your queen, not Burger King. You don't get it your way. And, you, and because you haven't learned to live with delayed gratification, sex with porn has taught you when you want it, you get it right now. And when your real partner doesn't want to do it, you're frustrated. And the issue is not her, the issue is you. One more false expectation. And this one is going to make everyone's booty go, mm. I'm even dreading saying these parts out loud. But we got to go there. Porn gives you the false expectation to only get what you desire. See, what porn does is it teaches you sex is about what I want, how I want it. And I don't even consider the thoughts and the feelings and the desires of the other person. And so you watch porn, it's all about you. There's no one else in the room. It's how you want it. And what ends up happening, you get into a marriage and you're like, if you love me, you'd, you'd give this to me. I want it like this. If you and then you get frustrated and then you manipulate the person to give you what you want because porn taught you sex is about what you want, not what the other person wants. And you have confused love and lust. Love says, I'm here to serve and to give lust, which is a perversion of love, says, lust says, I'm here to take, and you're here to serve me. I get couples, they'll meet with us, like, Pastor Al, we need to meet. We need to meet, Pastor Ali. I'm so frustrated in my marriage. And they'll sit down on a couch, and it's so, like, awkward. I'm just gonna be real. It's one of the hardest conversations. I'll sit there on the couch, and the dude will be like, tell her, Pastor Ali. Tell her what? Tell her to give me a blowjob. And I give the same answer. Pastor Yasmin, what do you think we should do right here? <laughs> no, I, I don't. I don't. I'm just, just me joking, by the way. The real answer is anything the other person's uncomfortable with is sin. Anything the other person is uncomfortable with is sin. Because you don't realize, I wrote it like this. When you lay your body down on a bed for another person, that's an image of how Christ laid down his body for us. And what made his sacrifice powerful is that he wanted to do it. We didn't hold a gun to Jesus' head and say, die for me, I deserve it. And that's what you look like when you're demanding the other person serve you in a certain way. That's what porn does. It's not that she doesn't love you. It's that porn has taught you to to think that sex is only about what you want, how you want it, like this, and you have excluded the other person. Those are dangerous expectations that you bring into a marriage, and, and often what we don't realize is there's a lie that we believe that leads us down that path, and the first lie that we believe is simply this. The myth is this, that porn is an outlet. Pastor Charlie, I'm, I'm shaking. I gotta let it out. I can't even focus at work, Pastor Ali. You don't understand. I'm, I'm a dude. I get it. But that's the lie. 
that you think it's about releasing, you think it's, a, it's an outlet, and the word of God says something so, so different. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results, someone say results. It says results, not release. The results are sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. It gets worse when you do this. It gets worse. And the truth is, it's the opposite. It's a, the truth is this, that's an inlet. And by that I mean you're feeding the cycle so it gets worse and worse. When a dog is barking and the only way to shut it up is to give it food, you haven't broken its barking. You've only reinforced it will bark every time it wants food. And when you don't deny your flesh in that moment and you feed it, it's not an outlet. It's an inlet. You're reinforcing the thing you're trying to break. The second thing that often the lie that we believe is that sex is a need. This one is hilarious to me. Because I went to public school. I'm not that smart. You can go, they say, 40 days plus without food. As long as you have water, you'll survive. Without water, it's three to seven days you'll die. They say the average person could go a, a minute to two minutes without oxygen. In Korea and in Japan, men who are in their 30s are dying of heart attacks because they're working 35, 45 hours plus straight. So you need sleep. You need water. You need food. And you need oxygen. It is a lie, listen, that you need sex. I've never gone to Facebook and said, oh my gosh, babe, our friend Joe, his coworker died. What happened? He exploded at work. <laughs> what do you mean he exploded? The article says he, he didn't have sex for a year, he just blew up at work. <laughs> his wife's going to jail. That's what happens if it's a need. You should die. I've never heard anyone dying because they didn't have sex. And listen, Jesus never had sex. The greatest man who ever lived. And yet often, because you believe this lie, do you know when statistically most men, if they break free from porn, you know when it comes back? And it breaks my heart to say this is when their wife is pregnant. Because you believe the lie, this is a need. And she's not giving it to me. Right? She's pregnant. And so you will use that fake justification to get what you want. Because you believe this lie. The truth is this, that sex is a gift. It's not a need. It's a gift. And what's in the devil's hands, it will destroy the two of you. And what's in God's hands, it will bring you two together. I know that Many of you come from a Catholic background, and God bless you for being here. But the Catholic Church teaches that sex is only for procreation. And my greatest argument against that is the book of Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is eight chapters of X-rated biblical theology. There, there's an entire chapter where she does a sexy dance for her husband. It's, I, I wish I was kidding. It's so X-rated, Jewish men would not allow their children to read this book until they got married. And the best part about the Song of Solomon, there are no children in that book. Amen. <laughs> not that God doesn't love children, but God didn't just create sex for children. He created it for our pleasure. But only it's pleasure when it's in his hands becomes a tool to tear you two apart when it's in the devil's hands. This next myth is just as damaging. It's better than cheating on my spouse. Pastor Ali, come on. I got, I got to release. I got to let it out. It's, a, it's an outlet. It's a need. Isn't it better that I do this, Pastor Ali, than cheat on my wife? I'm about to lose some people because Jesus has some words for you. Matthew 5. But I tell you that anyone who looks, someone say looks. Let me do it one more time. Because our tribe, a we're a loud church. When I, say, when I say this, say it louder. Someone say looks. looks. When you look, whether it's online or in real life, when you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with that person in your heart. 
And I get it. Even though Jesus is saying these things, some of you still push back. That's different, Pastor Ali. This is actually helping me not cheat. I get it. You fell on your head as a baby. You don't understand the English. Let me give it to you a different way. Wayne University, Wayne State University found that spouses who watch porn, remember, I'm speaking to the people that think that porn is going to help them from not cheating. I'm speaking to that crowd. Wayne State University found that spouses who watch porn are 300% more likely to cheat. The lie that you, the devil wants you to believe is that this is going to save your marriage. It actually becomes the very thing that destroys your marriage. Because that's how he attacks. God uses something to build you up. The devil uses the same thing to tear you down. So what happened to David in 2 Samuel 11. It says this, verse 1. In the spring, at a time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rahab. But David remained in Jerusalem. When he should have gone out to war, he stayed home and did nothing. That's, that's when most men stumble, is they don't have purpose, so they live their life for pleasure. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, someone say one evening. David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. I didn't know this until I went to Bible college, but Jerusalem was a city with a wall around the, that kept all the houses on the inside. Because you had to be protected. And the castle was the largest house in the city. So by going on the roof, you could overlook the entire city. Do you know when most people took showers in that culture? It's not like American culture. We have running water where I just go to a, a faucet and turn it on. You wouldn't take a shower in the middle of the morning or midday. It's 100 degrees in the Middle East. What they would often do is take a shower at night after you're covered with dust and sweat. So when David is going on the roof, listen to me, he knows exactly what he's doing. This is his version of the cable box. He's going to look down on people showering and watch what happens. Next verse. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Next verse. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Ilion, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Because that's the lie. This is going to save my marriage. It becomes the very thing that destroys your marriage. And here's the last lie or the last myth we believe about porn. Porn is free, Pastor Ali. I know Pornhub might be free, but there's a cost. There's always a cost. And there are typically four people that pay that price. The person you're watching is not free. They're paying a price. You will pay that price. If it's not you, it's your wife that will pay that price. If it's not you or your wife, listen, your children will pay that price. The truth is this, that porn always, it always has a price. David lost three of his kids simply because he wanted to go on the roof and look. So how do I become free? I'm so thankful you asked. I'm praying this is the part of the sermon where you have hope. That this isn't just for the super Christians, this is for every Christian. And the first thing you gotta do is you gotta confess to God. And this is the part that's most challenging because many of you in this room think it's not that bad, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing, I'm not hurting anyone, and you have to call things the way that God calls them. If it's sin, you gotta name it sin. And the Bible is super clear. God hates, hates sin. Doesn't hate you, hates sin. So why do you love the thing that breaks his heart? Why do you think the thing that breaks his heart is gonna fulfill yours? You can't be free until you agree with him. You gotta confess, I agree with you. That's what confession is. It's agreement. I agree with you. I agree with you. That's why in Psalm 32, David says this, I then acknowledge my sin to you. Not my pastor, it's first to him. And do not cover up my iniquity. I stopped hiding. 
I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. And often what happens in these moments is we, we don't have a proper understanding of confession. We, we think, oh, I'm gonna do this alone in my bedroom. I'll just talk to God. And that's what happened to me when I was 26. I was alone with God. I said, Lord, I agree with you. And I prayed the prayer and then walked out free. Come on, I'm just, I was hoping you'd clap. You're like, no, you stupid, no. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The Bible doesn't say, give the prayer a confession. It's different. It's the cycle of confession. And that's what many of you, I'm hoping, understand. It's, it's not a one-time thing. It's again and again and again. And what the devil will do is he will begin, if you can't see it, I'll say it out loud, with deception. That's how he always begins. And deception says this, this is good. This is good. He wants you to agree with, Satan wants you to agree with him, not with God. That's how the cycle begins. You always have to believe a lie before you sit in that area. And then once you believe the lie, the next part is temptation. Do it, do it, do it, do it. It's not that bad. It was crazy. You'll believe the lie and then you do it. And the moment you do it, the same devil that was in your ear chirping the whole time, he'll give you this next thing, which is condemnation. I can't believe you did it. Two things that happen with this cycle. Number one is shame. Number one is shame. I can't, I can't, you're, you call yourself a Christian? You shouldn't go to church. Oh my gosh. And if this cycle goes on long enough, what ends up happening is your mistake becomes your identity. And now that sin that you do isn't something you do, it's who you are. Because you have mistaken confession as a one-time thing. And it's not a prayer of confession. It's the cycle. Someone say cycle. But what God wants you to do is, is different. Let me underline the key phrases. The next one is the truth. The first is the truth. This is bad. You gotta, you gotta agree with God about what porn is. And the part that many of you don't understand is it's not a prayer that you pray one time. And God doesn't love you because you're awesome, because you're perfect. This isn't religion where you earn your love, where, where you behave a certain way, and if you're better than everybody else, well, maybe, maybe then he'll bless you and love you. This is Christianity. God says all of us are jacked up. He doesn't love us based on behavior, based on, on position. So if I'm in Christ... I'm fully forgiven and fully loved, even though I'm jacked up. And the word that you gotta realize is I am forgiven. And on this side it says do it, on this side it says Jesus did it. Because if you only celebrate your righteousness, you will always fall. And the cycle on this side is different. It looks and sounds like this, in the beginning, but it changes. And the word here is conviction, not condemnation. And it sounds like this, you're better than this. And with the same sin sounds so different in the hand of the devil than God. On this side, it's shame. I can't believe you did that. You shouldn't go to church. You're awful. Better not tell anyone, because if they find out who you really are, psh, you're done. On this side, it's, it's different. Oh, you feel something. But it's not shame. It's this other word called guilt. Because God's pulling you up. 
See, condemnation pushes you down. Stay down. You're awful. You don't deserve this. God says, he reaches down and pulls you back up and says, you're better than this. Because you don't realize who's talking to you. The devil wants you dead. God died so that you can live. It's different. When God comes, he's trying to speak life over you. You're better than this. Do you know who your father is? He's the king of kings, which means by adoption, you're a prince and a princess. So he's saying, why are you acting like a slave when you're a prince? It's different. He's speaking to your identity. He's trying to give you an identity. In this one, it's position. In this one, it's performance. And what ends up happening here is you will fall and fall because you're doing it on your strength. And then you're just throwing the towel. I, I can't. It's not that Christianity was tried and didn't work. It's that you did it on your strength. But on this side, it's different. And I gotta tell you, the reason why it's called the cycle of confession, 1 John 1 verse 9 says this, if we confess our sin, no, 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 go, uh, I believe it's Proverbs 24, 16. I may have put out of order. Though the righteous falls down seven times. Someone say seven times. Seven times. They rise again. It's different. See, on the other side, the cycle of freedom, I'm going to go weak. And I'm still going to come to church. Because it's not my righteousness, not my clothes that allows me to come in the room. It's his blood. God, I'm forgiven. God, you called me to be a prince. Help me, Lord. I'm confessing. I am agreeing with you. And then you'll go a month and you'll fall down again. But because your mindset's different. I, I'm not going to be perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. It's not a one-time confession that once you didn't do it, you're done. No, no, no. I, I, this is a cycle. I did it longer than I did last time. Then I'm going to go two months and fall. Then I'm going to go three months and fall. I'm going to keep confessing God. How long, Pastor Charlie? Until I'm free. That's why it's different. Point number two. Point number two is this. Confess to the right people. After you've started the cycle of confession where you're agreeing with God and that prayer doesn't make you perfect, it just begins the perfect process to change you, you gotta, you gotta tell someone else. And that's where James chapter 5 comes in. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Someone say healed. And here's why. The prayer of a righteous person. So this is what the concept of this is trying to teach is that there's one person confessing and another person praying. There's one person that's saying, I need help, and I have God, but it's not enough. I need more. And the other person saying, God gave me freedom in this area. I'm going to pray, and that's where authority comes from. It does not work when both of you are stuck. It's when one is free, he helped me, I can help you. This is why it's the right person, not just any person. But you need two things. You need honesty and consistent confession. See, honesty is you will be as sick as your secrets, and you will be as healed as your confession. I remember as a youth pastor, there was this one kid Every week was the same prayer. And everyone in the youth group knew what his struggle was. Like, Lord, you know what I struggle with. Help me. General prayers don't bring specific freedom. If you can't be honest, you won't be free. And the second part of it is you need consistent. Someone say consistent. See, what cons confession is, it's, it's a cycle. And it's where I go to someone who has freedom in this area and say, hey, hey, I need your help to help me get free. I, I actually need you to call me and ask how I'm doing. And our culture doesn't like that. We don't like accountability. I wrote like this, accountability only feels like an attack when you're not ready to change. What were you doing on Friday? Why you, what, what's the business of you? Bro, you, 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 you asked me to help you. I'm not calling because I'm nosy. I'm not calling because you're a celebrity, no one cares. You called me to help you. But if you're not ready for change, I won't call back. Number three, set up guards. 
set up guards. What David should have done, he should have told his men, never allow me to walk on the roof after six o'clock. But we don't have roofs today. We have IG, we have TikTok, we have the internet. And your cell phone, it needs guards. If you have no restrictions, you're crazy. If David, listen, this is the part that so many Christians don't understand. They go, Pastor Ali, I'm good. I go to church every week. I read my Bible. I can do this. David wrote 20% of the Bible. If he can fall, homie, you can fall. Actually, because you've written nothing, you're definitely falling. You're definitely falling. 1 Corinthians 10. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful. That's the Bible's way of saying, don't be stupid. That you don't fall. No temptation has overcome, overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Which means you're not alone. You're not alone. And this is where the devil will come into your life and he will twist the rules that you create for yourself. Oh my gosh, you're so religious. Oh my gosh, you're that, you're that weak. And he'll try to shame you. You might need to go ahead two slides, Dalen, but it's this. There's a difference between corporate legalism versus personal legalism. See, corporate legalism is where one leader says, oh, God spoke to me. Now all of you need to do this. Let me give you an example of corporate legalism that I want to do. Every Raiders fan, every Cowboys fan in this room needs to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. All of you must be Niner fans. That would be me imposing on you corporate legalism. That's not biblical, by the way. That's why the Pharisees, they, you know why one of their nicknames was bloody forehead? Because they, they wanted to live such a holy life and never look at a woman lustfully that they would walk around with their heads down. And then they told everyone, if you want to follow Jesus, this is what you got to look like. And all the male are like, bro, I need, I need to look up. I'm delivering mail. What are you talking about? And so then no one ended up following them because it felt like this yoke, this corporate legalism you couldn't do. And so then you throw out the baby and the bathwater. But personal legalism is good. God says something to you, not to everybody else, and he knows your weakness, so he's trying to help you out. I can't watch Game of Thrones. It's not that I don't love people bloody dying. I love those things. There's too many naked women on that show. But I can't put that on you. The Holy Spirit convicted me. And so I put that yoke, not because I'm religious, because I'm wise. Amen. Proverbs 12 says, the fool doesn't listen to wisdom. The wise listens to advice. I'm not saying listen to me. I'm saying listen to the Spirit of God. Because too many of you are trying to fight a battle you were never meant to fight. Now go to the previous verse. Watch where it says, in 2 Timothy, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee. Someone say flee. flee. That's Greek for run. Run from sexual immorality. The Bible never says fight it. And too many of you men are trying to manage and fight sin, and you will always lose. It doesn't matter how much you bench, how much you squat and deadlift. You can't lift this. You can't. The last one, the last one, let God heal your wounds. Let God heal your wounds. Depending on your background, some of you will think, oh, I can't break free of this, I must have a demon. And I'm all about demons. Some of you have them, they're called Laker fans, come on. <laughs> Just kidding, just a little bit maybe. But I, I totally believe in the demonic. I've, I've been in rooms where I've seen my pastor cast demons out. But some of you come from a tradition where if you were stuck in pornography, you were told you had a demon, and that's not the case. I believe now that's true, and you probably have trauma. You probably have trauma. Let me read you this statistic from the book, The Body Keeps the Score. This was categorizing a group of people and their profession and found out that 80% of people who have this profession were sexually assaulted by the age of 18. 
that people who have this profession, 70% of them were raped by the age of 18. And we think that strippers are ungodly people. The body keeps the score, says, no, they're just wounded people. And some of you, when you watch that image as an 11-year-old, you were wounded. You were forever different. Some of you, let's just be real honest. One in every four of you were touched inappropriately as a child growing up, and you struggle with porn, not because you have a demon, because you have a wound. And the good news of Christianity is God doesn't just die for our sin. He heals to heal our wounds. First, Second Peter verse 2 says this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Anybody thankful for Jesus, that he dies for our sin? But that's only half of it. By his wounds, someone say wounds. You are healed. No matter what was done to you, no matter what, in what way you were touched, from that moment you were forever different. But the good news of Christianity is that he can heal it. He doesn't just forgive it. He can heal it. With every eye closed and every head bowed. God, I pray specifically for all the men in this room. God, may we be free from this, this gift that you've given us that's now in the, the hand of the enemy. It's meant to make us closer to our wife and because it's in our life, it's tearing us from our, our wife. I pray, Lord, that freedom begins with confession. Just agreeing with you that this is bad. I pray, Lord, that we don't have the mindset that this is gonna be a one-time prayer. This is not the prayer of confession, but the cycle. God, that it's gonna be a fight. It's gonna be a daily, weekly, monthly fight until I have freedom in Christ. And God, if you did it for me, you can do it for them. I pray, Lord, for those that are wounded, that they can't, they can't understand why they keep going back, that they wouldn't just ask for forgiveness, God. They'd ask for wholeness and healing. For every person in this room, God, that is hungry for love, hungry for intimacy, that we get it in the ways that you desire. May we not drink from toilet water. May we drink from the living wall with every eye closed and every head bowed. God brought you to this church for a reason, not to hear a TED talk, because he wants a relationship with you. He's the living God. His name is Jesus. He created the heavens and the earth and he created sex to be a gift. And even though all of us fall short of his glory, of his plans, he entered human history 2,000 years ago and died for our sin, died for the ways in which we didn't live out sex his way. And he wants to offer that forgiveness to anyone who would call on his name. And to become a Christian is not about doing. Jesus already did it. He died on a cross for our sin for your sin and my sin. He lived the life we couldn't live and then he died the death we should have died. If that's you this morning and you wanna start a relationship with the living God, I want every eye closed and every head bowed. I'm gonna to count to three. I want you to shoot your hand up. You're not raising your hand for me or this church, but for Jesus. On the count of three, one, two, three. Just shoot your hand up if that's you this morning. See your hand. See your hand. See your hand. I want everyone to pray this prayer with me. Thank you, Jesus, for your perfect plan that I perfectly messed up. But God, you're a good God. You're a loving Father. And you sent Jesus to die as a substitute for my sin, for my sexual sin. I receive your forgiveness. I receive salvation. I turn from my sin, I repent, I confess and agree with you that that kind of sex is not good for me, Lord. I want what you want for me, Lord. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you all the days of my life. 
in Jesus' name.